Trevor Manuel is my guest today, uh, ex-minister of finance, minister in the present presidency. There's a whole lot of questions in on the WhatsApp line. If I ask all those questions, I won't have a chance to ask the questions that I've lined up. So a, a lot of them relating to corruption, people wanting you uh, to advise us, guide us on what our response should be as a as a country to the rampant corruption and the toll that it's taken. Uh, and then the, the, the message that we played earlier was about government has a role to play. There are some things that cannot be privatized. Are you in agreement with, with that conclusion? Broadly, I think one of the challenges that confronts us in South Africa is that South Africans, who are by the means, opt out. And so... That's an opportunity. People people who... I think most of us, and let's not pretend that it's not like that, I think that many of the, the listeners here as well are likely to have medical aid. It's an opting out. We have it. We have it because um, public health, is in the parlous state it is because nobody cares. Uh, I think that you're seeing the same with education. You're even seeing it with with private security companies and so on. So more and more, uh, South Africans who are by the means opt out and the quality of public services deteriorates. So the idea of an NHI, for instance, is a good idea, but the gap between public and private is much too great now to merely... Uh, use a magic wand and and, and hope that that you're going to fix the problem. So I think that's the beginning. And in that endeavor to to have the means to then afford private services, uh, there are more and more opportunities for corruption. These things are all interlinked. But we we inherited a system that had uh, uh, chunks. In fact, if you looked uh, at the situation in 94, um, I think about 14 to 16 percent of South Africans had access to medical aid, and the percentages are now virtually the same. So, and the spending on on that, I think it's 16, 17 percent of South Africans now. The spending on health care for the 17 percent is equal to the spending on public health care for the remaining 83 percent. And I think the consequences of that 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 inequality is self-explanatory. So government has a role to play, providing those basic services as they are required. Government has a massive role to play. Uh, what you're seeing is that that role diminish. In uh, the absence of government playing it. In the absence of government playing it. And I, I'll use the same example of, of public health care. Um, Clarence, we're talking in a province that is actually doing better than all the others. I was very impressed to see the Krutisky Hospital uh, recently was able to catch up on all the the uh, elective surgery that had built up during the COVID period. It's the only hospital in the country that has ever even come close to, to doing that. And I think uh, it speaks to uh, individuals in public health care who actually give a damn about what happens to patients. These issues actually matter. It, I think it also talks to leadership and management, competent mm. management within that health department. I want, yes. Some of them studied with me at Livingston. Uh-oh. Let me uh, just rub that in. <laughs> um, yeah, I, can, I, I know a few other people who studied there, but I won't go there. Now, please don't. Uh, <laughs> in healthcare, don't go to media. Um, so, 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 you know, I think that, that similarly in education, if you look at a good intention, um, no fee schools is fundamentally important. The enrollment numbers are high. So approaching 80% of South Africans now attend no fee schools. So quintiles uh, three, four, and five uh, don't have to pay fees at schools. The problem that has arisen is that it creates a lordship for principals and teachers who don't actually want parental oversight. And so school governing bodies have collapsed almost without exception in the no-fee schools. It's a problem. So you have a situation where where parents are paying for education. They know what's happening in the classroom, in the school. They attend, their their involvement is sought. And then for the majority, especially township and rural schools, there's no involvement. And, And you're seeing that in the results. If we don't fix education, you don't fix human capabilities. And I think the ability to transform the economy is going to be severely constrained. 
Yeah, let's 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 move on. And, and you touched onto it. Um, the issues of of medical aid. You said there are fewer people that have, or the same amount of people now have medical aid. I've been browsing through the review, tenure review of the NDP that you uh, orchestrated as minister in the presidency uh, after your stint as finance minister. Um, and it, it makes for very interesting reading, but essentially it concludes that we've gone backwards in the past 10 years, 2012 to 2022. Uh, and I think it is polite uh, in its comments about government's, uh, re government's contribution to that. Uh, it, of course, does note COVID. It does note Ukraine. It does note the issues of poverty, inequality and unemployment. All of those are well noted. Um, but it also says that government has not shown political will for it. Your response? Uh, I endorse that view uh, entirely. In fact, if you go back to the uh, National Development Plan, which we handed to the President in Parliament in August of 2012. Uh, it was 2012 to 2022, that's right. That is the 10-year yeah, review that I've just yeah. Um And... Um, we spoke about how you fix things, and there are three important elements that are actually revised in the in the review now. The first issue is you need capable leadership that is not afraid to take decisions. The second issue is that you need a capable state, and the third issue is that you need active citizenry. Now. In respect of a capable state, there's a there's a chapter, and it's it's interesting because these these themes are revisited in the final Zondo Commission report. That capable state requires, I mean, there's a notion that that's explained in the Public Finance Management Act of 1999. Ministers are responsible for outcomes. Directors general are responsible for outputs. So ministers can't get into the tank. They have to oversee what their departments do. It doesn't matter which minister you're talking about. And perhaps one of the most uh, 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 frequently televised ministers is uh, the chap who wears a hat, Minister of Police, Becky Trele. He's not a policeman. He's not the commissioner. His job is to account to South Africans about the organization of the police service utilizing the resources in order to prevent crime and then to act against criminals. That's, that's his job. That's the job description. That job description is articulated in the, in the South African Police Service Act. There was a fundamentally important decision taken in 1994. We don't need a police force. We need a police service. And, and the way in which this plays out impacts on the everyday lives of people. Because the poorer you are, the greater you're exposed to violent crime. So the minister announces to parliament that 27,000 people were violently killed between uh, March or April uh, uh, 2022 and, and, and March 2023. 27,000 people. Now, you mentioned Ukraine in passing. You know, 9,000 people were killed in the same period in, in, in Ukraine where there is a war. Now, how do you deal with that? Because that impacts on the quality of life of people. We have to get a handle, and you must have capable leadership. And in that capable leadership, you, you, you've got to call out the issues that are wrong. But government must be seen to be correcting that. And so that political administrative interface that Zondo speaks of, which is which is very, very important also in the National Development Plan and brought up in the review and the other side of it is, is something that has been articulated in UDF uh, on its 40th anniversary, active citizenry. You can't just have people uh, mobilized to vote once every five years, regardless of what happens in the intervening period. People must actually be actively involved in their everyday lives. It, it, that review does suggest that your target dates are unachievable. Number one, I want to know why. We had, we had RDP, we had Asgisa, uh, we had, we had, we had ND, NDP. Um, there's a suggestion that may have been elitist that hasn't been sold to us in order for us to own it on the ground and to drive it resolutely. There's a suggestion that we needed maybe to invoke the spirit of Stalin and drive it over a five-year plan resolutely. Uh, what are we going to do now? Look, there's a, there's a rather curious issue about the construct of the National Development, uh, of the National Planning Commission, which 
I I was I was the first chair of Cyril Ramaphosa was the first deputy chair of, and the construct is we could do the thinking, take advice, take evidence, craft a report, but the implementation was left to government, uh, and that I think is the the break that we need to talk about this morning. Maybe Stalin five year plan for the NDP minus the million lives lost. Look, it's. What we have in this country is not the inability to to draft yes uh, policy. We don't. <laughs> um, we 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 are lousy at implementation, and I think that that part of what creates a lousiness is is cater deployment, cater deployment, but also our parliaments are incredibly weak, uh, and and this has been the case. Uh, uh, certainly over the past uh, 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 four parliaments. Um, and uh, uh, unless, you have par unless you have ministers who feel accountable to parliament, uh, you're not going to resolve this. And unless you have a society that actually calls out things that are wrong. I mean, I pause and say that a single individual can use 160 million rand of taxpayers' money because she wants to remain in a job. And you think that that's what the Constitution allows. You think that that's what democracy is about. You think that that's what justice is about. Unless you stop that kind of behavior. And, and similarly, uh, you know, Chief Justice Zondo has called to, to mind the fact that the um, state attorneys have not actually billed Jacob Zuma for the many, many millions built up in legal costs because of his talent. Because of Stalingrad. Now, now, unless you come back to the Constitution and talk about equality before the law, what does this matter? Let's stay there for a short while because news in today is that there are certain people that want a review of the Zondo Commission findings and they uh, want that legal review. Uh, that legal review is state funded. Zondo Commission does not get the finance to defend the position. Uh, where are we going? It's quite bizarre because the Zondo Commission took a lot of evidence. I mean, if you go through, if you go through the reports, uh, it doesn't matter who. Uh, interestingly, the review of of uh, of the NDP uh, says about the NDP, we couldn't craft it differently. The problem is not in the crafting; the problem is in implementation. The problem with, with the Zondo Commission report is in implementation. I know that, that um, uh, the, the uh, I forget what the name of the agency is, uh, is doing remarkable work when they are mandated to do it. But the, the truth of the matter is that overall, Parliament has been abysmally absent in respect of dealing with all of the Zondo Commission report. And let me also call out the fact that notwithstanding the, the, the fact that, that a number of high-profiled individuals are named in various parts of the Zondo report, some of them are sitting in the cabinet room. And, and, and the minute you demonstrate a tolerance to that kind of corruption, you don't put people aside and say, you've got to step aside now. You've been named in Zondo. Uh, we Step aside now. Uh, if you clear your name, you can, you'll be invited back in. But until then, we, we need legal process to actually prosecute those who are guilty. Unless you deal with that, you aren't doing anything about corruption. Uh, you mentioned a lot of challenges we inherited, quote, unquote, referring to apartheid and colonial challenges that you've inherited in 1990. Fulindiwe Zulu last week or a month ago said that the fire at the Joburg uh, block of flats uh, was caused by, by apartheid. When, when do we take responsibility for no. things in, in this country? No, let me be blunt about this. Um, the apartheid regime was there for not very long. It was, it was 40, 40, 40 years by which time it had run out of steam. By 88, it was gone. We knew then, after successive states of emergency, it had no life left in it. We've been there for 30 years. They did a hell of a lot of damage in the 40 years they were there. We haven't repaired a fraction of it. We've gone backwards. 
We've gone backwards partly because we don't have the drive, the energy, the determination, and we don't have a system that says the people first. But to peel it, uh, must be measured in everything we do. Mr. Manuel, we have some voice notes and then maybe some quick fire questions. Just a summary of some of the questions that have come through. Let's take a listen, Joe. Uh, good morning, Clarence. I just wanted to pose a few questions to our former uh, finance minister, Trevor Manuel. Um, is he going to go back to parliament or as a member of parliament uh, after the next election? And uh, what does he think of the state of the economy, um, especially the rand dollar exchange rate? That's almost 90. Yeah, I think you said 1919 in the last bulletin. Um, as well as the interest rate cycle uh, keeps on climbing, high inflation and high in unemployment. But the main question is: Is he willing to return if nominated by the branches? Thank, Thank you for that. Minister, I nearly said minister. <laughs> Clarence, I think that uh, politics uh, is a very exacting uh, activity. It's not a profession. It was never a profession. It was something we needed to do. Um, I, I served as a member of parliament and in cabinet for 20 years. It's a, it's, a, it's a distinct privilege to be able to do that. You do it with everything you've got, and then you step aside and hope that the next generation will come through. And I think it's fundamentally important. I just happen to be of the view that, that our political leaders need to reflect uh, South Africa more closely. And South Africa is a young country. Yeah. The fact that you've got nice. so many people over 65 who are sitting in cabinet and parliament and so on is part of the difficulty you yeah, must have. We don't have. need more. We don't need more. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the wrong side of the age curve now. Uh, and and this is a big issue. I'm but I'm happy. With you. I'm, I'm happy. But there's an assumption there. There's an assumption that you are a member of the ANC still. Maybe Maybe you want to deal with that? The, 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 I think the, 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 the point I'd like to make first is that I'm happy to take the skills that I've acquired because by the time I got to parliament, I didn't, even, I didn't even know what went on there. I think that we accumulated a lot of knowledge in Quickly. a short space of time. You've got to call on people like who've been there to be able to plow back, and I've always indicated my willingness to do that. I'm not, I'm not an active member of any political party at not the moment. Not a card-carrying member. Not a card-carrying member, not an active member of any political party. Um, but that doesn't uh, detract from my ability, my love for the country and my ability uh, and determination to help where we are needed to help. Okay, a couple of uh, just quick fire questions. Um, somebody's suggesting that the, the ANC should lose the next election because that... The flotsam and jets, the, fl the flotsam and jetsam will leave the party, and the essence um, that carries proudly the tradition of the African National Congress will remain uh, and maybe reinvigorate it. That's wishful thinking. I think that that it's the flotsam and jetsam that you want to leave who never leave, because they are entirely dependent. Other people who've acquired skills. Uh, as part of, of the ANC development, get on to do other things in life. I think a, a number of people who are, who are my colleagues and people are a bit younger, both from pol public uh, uh, office and also public service, who've gone on to do other great things. Um, but those who are desperate hang in there uh, with white knuckles, and that's the problem, and you've seen it all over the African continent. Okay, somebody, uh, this person doesn't want you back in Parliament, only they want you back in Kensington. Do you have a response to her? I'll just try and get to her name quickly. What does <laughs> she want you for in Kensington? That's a good question. I know Mitchell's playing wants you there because you were very active there as well. Look. What, what does Kensington mean to you? Let's put that question to Kensington me. is where I, I grew up. I mean, I was, I was born in Kensington, grew up in Kensington, but in a curious way. Because I schooled in Salt River, the bulk of my years until I, I was in Salt River until Standard 8 at Wesley, uh, and I interacted quite extensively in Salt River. So I was kind of, I was kind of polygamous then already between Kensington and, and, and Salt River, uh, and then later went, went to town, to the district, to Cressy uh, for, for, for uh, uh, high school after, after secondary school. 
but you know, and and my my political teeth were cut in Kensington as well. I, I I was I was still at school when I was was already active in the community. There's a guy on TV behind you. Sorry, Joe is just drawing my attention to the president behind you. Um, president Ramaphosa is on TV at this moment in time, and Joe here wants to know about your relationship with him. Look, I I um, w w we've come a long way together. Um, and uh, we used to meet quite frequently on the promenade in, in, in Greenpoint for mm. walks and so on. And we no longer do that. It's just the force of circumstances. But you're still there. Everybody tells me about it. I when still, you're available. I still walk when I'm in Cape Town. Yeah. Yeah. So you would talk to him? I would talk to him. I don't have a difficulty with anybody uh, in any political party. I will talk to people. And I think I have a responsibility to try and talk to the president. Uh, we've done so many things together, and I think that, uh, um, you know, but, but, but what tends to happen is that those closest to employed uh, within, within offices of heads of state try and create barriers to protect heads of state from the riffraff like me and you, Clarence. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, the next question then is if you're not a card-carrying member, uh, th that means you... You don't know who you're going to be voting for. Who should we vote for? It's a real difficulty because I, I think that all of us uh, should be engaged in different process. What I'd like is for a situation where where we can we can breach uh, what exists now as proportional representation, so you only vote for the party. But it's quite important for the party to be able to say. In, in Kailicha, uh, there are X number of voters, um, and, and these are the people that this party will put up in Kailicha uh, and, and allow voters to know what that relationship is. And so after the election, parties are meant to open constituency offices, and they're meant to place people there who are related to these communities. This becomes an important test. And if you do this, then you don't fall back on the lowest common denominator, which is proportional representation, say the party decides. You actually build this relationship. And I know this from my own experiences when I was an assigned MP in Mitchell's Plain. I loved it. And even though people didn't vote for the ANC in Mitchell's Plain, um, we would have meetings and talk to people. And the fact that I'm still involved in the bursary trust in Mitchell's Plain grew out of that process. But, and it's such an important question, I think, for everybody listening. Uh, we do feel as if we are on the precipice in this particular country. It is an important question. And on three occasions this morning, you spoke about Parliament and the important role that it's not playing, that it should be playing. And it's ultimately through voting that Parliament gets constituted. <laughs> So we need to get a sense of the kind of politics that is going to correct our trajectory. Uh, and, yeah, any ideas on that? I think the first issue is leadership. You must know what kind of leadership will be there, what issues will be corrected. Right? And it's not, it's not crudely uh, the election manifestos that will be there and have been there before and get dusted off and reproduced for every election. It's about ensuring that, that th those who are elected into office will do the things that make a difference. Um, and part of doing the things that make a difference is being available and talking to people. I mean, we, have, we must be unique in that uh, we have very senior political leaders who never sit down and converse with the press. Converse with the people through the agency of the press uh, and converse with parliament. Uh, and I think that, that that distinguishes us. You, you are Mr. Pragmatic. You've, you've, you've exercised that being that you are in, especially that portfolio as finance minister. There are pressures that are real out there. There's real politics that must happen. In pragmatically, we want, we want to learn from you about the politics in this particular country. Is it not necessarily maybe important for, for the center to, to maybe form a coalition at this moment in time? Because both the right and the left are not necessarily defined with a strong center that will give the right and the left to coalesce as they should. Uh, is it not the time for the ANC and the DA to look at, at a future together in bed? 
Look, the, I think the first the first issue that becomes important is that in both parties, there's a spectrum. There's a left and a center in the ANC, and there's a right and a center in the DA. Yeah, and and you've got to construct something that'll 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 carve off the ends, but it also means that you must have people who, who you know, there can't be a free ride in Parliament. Uh, or, or free ride in, 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 in politics. The, the, the difficulty we have is that a backbench MP now earns something in the order of uh, 1.3 million a year. You don't, there's no entrance qualification and you don't actually have performance uh, criteria for that as well. Um, you've, got to, you've got to address that differently and this means that parties must step up to the plate differently and parties must be held accountable because they put the people there. Um, and and part of the tragedy, part of the tragedy is in 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 KZN there are two hundred and ninety eight councillors who are illiterate. Now this is not I'm not hitting on on, on on illiterate people, but how do you expect people to pass laws, to write laws, to understand budgets if they can't see numbers and if they can't see words? It's a tragedy. So there's no real kind of answers that we have at this moment in time. Is, is it time for a watershed moment in South African politics? I do think it's, t it's okay. time for a watershed moment. Perhaps that watershed moment comes not in a moonshot pact, but in a different arrangement that says... Helen Zilla defines moon, uh, or rather watershed, as the ANC getting under 50%. Is, is, is that it? I wouldn't use Helen Zilla as a reference point for most things. And certainly not on this issue either. I think that she's a force for destruction even within the DA. And I expect your lines to light up now. They are. Um, You're psychic. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not, I, I don't arrive at the same conclusion about many people in the DA. But Helen Zilla, I think, is a very destructive force. And the sooner she understands that she must step away and allow for the forces of nature, including of age, to develop, and find a new equilibrium, the better it will be for that party and for all of South Africa. So again, what would the watershed moment be for you? It may be the, the need to construct a coalition. It may be the need for rationality. It may be the basis for that coalition. I know that there was a conference recently. There was a conference recently in, 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 in Johannesburg uh, about this moonshot pact. I don't think it's going to get anywhere uh, at any time, not soon, not later. There's no basis. I think that what is important in this watershed is was actually articulated by uh, Dr. Corne Mulder recently at a conference in Santon when he spoke about the UDF. When he spoke about the UDF, now civil society. It's about it's about understanding that. And again, you know, I've I've, I've I'm, I'm saying it's about school governing bodies, community police forums, health committees, people doing things that allow them to take control of their everyday lives that, that'll show up as, as, as a difference in the quality of democracy. And then perhaps parliamentarians will tail behind communities.